So <clears throat> uh, next up we have Lisa, Lisa Record. Um, she curates the Places and Spaces Mapping Science, um, a, a traveling exhibit from Indiana University Cyber Infrastructure for Network Science Center, or CNS. So CNS <laughs> creates more open source tools for, uh, it creates open source tools for data visualization and analysis and performs big data mining and filtering. And I have to say, I love this question. What good is big data if it can't help us make better decisions? That's what I want to know. <laughs> so take it away. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure if I can answer that question. It's a big one. But um, I was reading through some visitor interviews about data-related terms and their familiarity with them. Um, and I was struck by one comment in particular, although it echoed what a lot of people were saying. Um, when asked what big data was, the response was, I don't know and I don't like it. So that's where we're starting from. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about a traveling exhibit that showcases best examples of data visualization in hopes of empowering people to use data to make better decisions. So to begin with, I thought I'd start with a, a brief introduction to the exhibit, which is called Places and Spaces Mapping Science. Here it is at the Center for Disease Control Museum in Atlanta. The exhibit operates a little bit like a juried art exhibit where um, each year we put out a call for submissions, um, pull in all those submissions, meet with our advisory board of 17 different members, and then come to decisions about which ones we're going to add to the exhibit. Um, in 2015, we made the decision to move away from showing um, two-dimensional, flat, hang-on-the-wall data visualizations to doing interactive visualizations. And um, we call those visualizations macroscopes. What's a macroscope, you might ask? It's, um, we define macroscopes as software tools that help people focus on patterns in data um, that are too large or too complex to be able to see without help. So it's like a microscope will let you see things that are small, um, a telescope will let you see things that are far away, and a macroscope will help you see patterns in data. Why the move from maps to macroscopes? First of all, it just was time to go there. The data visualizations that we were receiving were increasingly interactive, and so as we're writing labels for those, we kept having to say, for the fully interactive version, go online, you know, or look it up here to, to, act, to interact with it. Um, so it made sense to move to interactive visualizations. But beyond that, we also felt that manipulating visualizations can help people understand them better. So if they can touch it and move it and look at it from different angles, that really helps. And from an even bigger perspective, we have a goal of wanting visitors to be able to take an active role in understanding and using data. And so having a touchscreen kiosk that they can actually touch is, is one step closer to being able to interact with data and to be able to not be afraid of it. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to start by going through our process and some of the challenges that we encountered along the way, and then I'll do a brief introduction to the macroscopes that we ended up selecting for the exhibit. We already had an exhibit team in place, but we needed new skills. Um, at Indiana University, we are lucky to have the Advanced Visualization Laboratory on campus, and they are tasked with helping um, playing with new technology and then making it usable for researchers and faculty. And so we were able to borrow an, a developer, a software developer from their team to work with us through this process. Um, we also leaned on other resources around the university, the IT department, of course. Um, we also talked with our copyright program librarian about some of the intellectual property concerns that were different in this format. And we talked a little bit with a digital preservation librarian to um, to understand how we could archive these digital objects. Um, our first step was to define submission requirements. We talked about whether we wanted to limit in terms of what operating system these things worked in, whether there were hardware constraints, um, what the topic was going to be, and what type of data we were interested in showing. And in the end, we decided to leave it as wide open as we could because the idea behind the exhibit is really to showcase examples from a wide range of disciplines so that um, they can be used across different boundaries and, and different topics. Oh, sorry. There, can you hear me better now? Okay. Um, so, so we really only limited by topic and said that we wanted macroscopes that would help people understand science better. Um, in terms of intellectual property concerns, 
a lot of these were created with open source software, which is great, but it also means that needs to be available open and freely, the products that are, are created using that. So there might be some concerns in terms of if you have a revenue stream, like we sell maps from the exhibit, or if you're charging admission to the exhibit hall, those were questions that our copyright librarian raised. Um, also the data, we, um, we came to understand that European data sets are protected, whereas in the US they're not necessarily. So that can be a concern as well as uh, a lot of researchers sometimes will work with uh, data sets that are, they're using under, um, under license or under contract, which can impose some other considerations in how those are displayed. And then last, our, um, our copyright librarian suggested that of course we place the, the burden of, um, of compliance on the macroscope makers. So we have them uh, sign an, an agreement that says that they have the ability to give us permission to use them. In the end, we ended up with um, three web apps and then an animation of a macroscope that sort of described how that macroscope could be used. And so um, the solution we came up with per for presenting these four different things created by different developers in, in a unified format was to, um, to wrap them in an iframe and um, and then deliver that with a portable version of Firefox, which was kind of locked down so that people couldn't escape and go check their email or surf the web from the kiosk. Um, it's a 46 inch touch screen um, and we pack it up in this road case and ship it off. We decided that it was important to us that we have control over how it was displayed. So we wanted to send the hardware with it. We didn't want people to be displaying it on their own hardware um, with who, you know, where we didn't have control over how that was displayed. We used evaluation a couple of different ways throughout the process. Um, we just used some quick and dirty um, polls and we would pull out paper mock-ups and say, what will you expect if you click on this button to just kind of double check that people were gonna understand how to move through um, and find the information that they wanted. And then we also use Google Analytics on the kiosk so that we can tell how people are navigating within the kiosk. and. Um, you know, are they looking at just one macroscope or are they, which ones are their favorites um, to get some more information about how it's used, which is really important for us because we're not on site when this travels. We're, you know, hundreds of miles away, thousands of miles away. So it gives us some insight into how it's actually being used. And now I'm going to introduce uh, the macroscopes that we ended up with. Um, the first one is called Earth, which you may have seen all these. They all exist in other ways um, and in other places. But Earth, which was by Cameron Beccario, shows um, wave height, wind speed, pollution distributions around the world. And it's an excellent example of how you can take a huge amount of data and put it in a really understandable format. People can turn that globe, focus in on the location that they're interested in, um, choose which variables they want to see. Um, and make sense of data that's being updated continuously. Like every three hours is the oldest data that you'll see on there at any one time. Um, and they can understand it immediately. The second macroscope is called Academy Scope. It was a partnership between CNS and the Ac National Academy of Sciences. And it uses full text lexical analysis to help people navigate and find publications that are related to each other. It's all the publications that the National Academy of Sciences has um, has published. Uh, the third one, this one is really cool. It's um, Kalev Lideru who created this and it's, um, it uses the news of the world as its data source. So it's drawing from 65 different languages and it's drawing from print, online, radio, all kinds of formats of news. And it's taking all of that information and showing you connections between countries. So any country that's mentioned with another country in a news article, those are those lines that you're seeing up there on the globe connecting those two countries. So you can spin the globe and you can pick a country and, um, and look at what connections it has around the world. And then last, but by no means least, uh, Charting Culture by Maximilian Schick and Mauro Martino. Um, this is an animation of their macroscope, which, um, which narrates some of the insights of using it, but it's, um, it shows uh, death locations in red and birth locations in blue and it's taking the information from Google Freebase and showing how people have migrated. So um, we're looking at cultural centers like you're seeing LA which has this huge draw because of the Hollywood and the movie industry so people move to Hollywood and that's where they end their lives. 
Um, and so you can see this progression. <laughs> <laughs> Not that they commit suicide, but um, but you can see where people move over their lifetime. So Paris is off is the same way. You see a big red dot because it's a place people go if they want, if or at least in, in former centuries, where if they wanted to participate culturally and be known, be involved in the arts, you had to move to Paris to do it. So um, so those are the four macroscopes that we chose. That's a really quick introduction and to some of the challenges that we encountered along the way. Um, we talked about pulling the right skills and knowledge into the team, um, divine, defining the requirements, um, some intellectual property concerns, uh, finding the right hardware and software solutions, and evaluating effectiveness along the way. My hope is that these macroscopes will help demystify large data sets and empower people to engage with the data. And who knows, maybe they'll even decide they like it. Because really, what good is data if we don't use it to make better decisions and make our lives better? Thank you, Lisa. Um, any questions? Yes. Can you, can you talk just briefly about how you're preserving and archiving? You mentioned That's, it very briefly. Yes. Um, well, the best solution that we've come up to date is to create videos that show how each of these is used. Um, and we've, had, we've tried to interview each of the macroscope makers as they come to campus. A lot of them we've bring, in, bring them in for talks and things. So, um, so we're basically archiving them as videos. We haven't come up with a great solution for how we could archive them and maintain the functionality. So if anybody has ideas, we would love to hear them. I have a response to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, I think with digital art and new media art, um, a lot of the time, the actual hardware and software isn't the important essential components of it, but it's the story around what you're making. So I think being able to archive the instructions in order so that someone can reproduce the concept of these projects on whatever platform, whatever hardware, whatever software is available in the future, that's really the important core essential thing behind these type of work. So I think about that. So um, now, so what your talks really have, I, I would say, like one of the things they've got in common, because most, for the most part, we started out talking about backend data, and 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 then end up talking about, uh, uh, you know, wound up uh, wound up talking about uh, user centric or you know, uh, audience facing data, um, but both what they have in common really is that we're talking about revealing things that were not obvious. Um, and uh, so I wonder if you have, um, if either of you want to talk about uh, like what the, um, you want to talk about like how you get from having big data to essentially meaning or like to, to having a story. Does anyone want to like, take that on. You want to go? <laughs> well, in our case, it's a, many, a process that involves many people. And I think that um, we take submissions from in, all over the place. Um, many of them are academic in nature. Um, some of them are from commercial applications. Some of them are um, from various arenas. And then um, the challenge is try to take those macroscopes and make them understandable for a general public. And what, what translates across all of that is the message. Um, and so just translating that message in different ways for different audiences, I think, is, is the, big, the big important idea. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I think for the Met, um, something that I realizing I've been at the Met for about a year and a half now, and the Met has a really impressive collection, but it also is a content production house. Um, the Met produces video, um, interpretive scholarship, et cetera. So I think for us, it's um, surfacing a lot of that content so that we can make those connections internally within the Met. So we can present to you an object, but also show you audio guide content that we've produced for it, or video content that we have, or essays that we have that go along with it. And um, weaving that story, I think, is, is a lot of what this work is going towards. Yeah. Cool. Does anyone else have any other questions? 
the, the, the session uh, technically is, is over, it's, uh, it's 9.30, but um, there isn't, a, you know, there isn't a, a session starting immediately, so if people had one more or two more questions, then we could do that. Um, it's, it's, it's up to everyone here. Otherwise, thank you both.